Right, so this is an interesting story, not only because it nails on just how breathtakingly ruined Israel is reputationally, militarily, and internationally, but because this comes from an Israeli news source itself. The Israeli version of The Guardian, in fact, Haaretz, using Benjamin Netanyahu's oft-used total victory phrase against him in an article headlined, Total Defeat. If Bibi was fed up with Haaretz before, with threats to shut them down, this story will have him climbing the walls. But there is so much to agree with in it, so much of it that makes sense. There really is no way out of this that will restore Israel's standing on the world stage. And any nations associating with them, defending them, and expressing their loyalty towards them, are only damaging their own reputations at the same time. You can take a stand for what is right and finally deal with this appalling administration, or you can go down with them in total defeat. Right, so Israel is facing total defeat, according to Haaretz newspaper in an op-ed article written by Haim Levinson, and this article is anything but pro-Hamas, but definitely anti-Netanyahu too, and puts a large amount of the focus on him and the batshit coalition regime he has assembled about him as the reason for it, as this excerpt shows. After half a year, we could have been in a totally different place, but we're being held hostage by the worst leadership in the country's history, and a decent contender for the title of worst leadership anywhere, ever. Every military undertaking is supposed to have a diplomatic exit. The military action should lead to a better diplomatic reality. Israel has no diplomatic exit. It has a scoundrel for a leader, someone with no capacity for leadership or decision making, a person who loses his sense of good judgment over a free cigar. Yet the electorate puts its faith in the current prime minister to the tune of 32 Knesset seats. That's a caustic description, isn't it? But very true. They say a lot of us would agree with that. Many of us would be significantly less polite about Netanyahu as well. Reputationally, Israel has gone from playing the world's biggest professional victims, a nation so many sympathised with that uses anti-Semitism to get whatever it wants, arguing it is racist to oppose them doing what they like and people being too afraid of being labelled as such to disagree with them, to now being seen as a global pariah state having been attacked by Hamas and having hostages taken and being sympathised with over that, to now no longer being seen as the victim but the aggressor and instigator of genocide against the entire population of the Gaza Strip. And not just Hamas, but everyone there. And that isn't a genie that is going to go back in its bottle. Frankly, there is no way back from that, with the eyes of the world having been opened, save for the government of Netanyahu to fall, Netanyahu and his cabinet being brought up on war crimes, as I think they should be, and the withdrawal of Israel from the occupied Palestinian territories with borders being redrawn along at least 1967 lines. But for many, the very existence of Israel won't be conducive to that. And actually, any successive governments of Netanyahu's, given the level of indoctrination that seems present amongst many Israelis, though those going out and protesting against Netanyahu, I would, cons I would consider a reason to hope for some possible rationality amongst some at least, they may not elect a government that's any better than his. Without that, there is no hope of restoring Israel's reputation. It's going to take years anyway. Along with their reputation, though, there is the damage done to all foreign leaders insisting on still backing Israel, despite public ill feeling towards them globally, for what has happened in Gaza and their continued escalation, against the likes of Iran, most recently, of course, but also Lebanon and Syria. The US and the UK are probably the most stuffed, because since both face elections this year, provided Rishi Sunak doesn't run away from it until the legal limit, by which time he must call one, which is actually January of next year. Because no matter if Sunak or Keir Starmer become Prime Minister after that, slavish loyalty to Israel seems assured. The same can be said of Biden and Trump. Militarily, Israel is probably at the limit of its ability to contain what is happening in the Middle East right now. If they strike against Iran again, as seems likely at this moment in time, Iran are not going to pull their punches a second time, as I'm certain they did this time around, with a paced strike, exclusive military targets, arguably done to test Israeli defences as much as anything else, but also so that much of the ordnance fired could also be dealt with by Israel. It was a flex, it wasn't a punch. And if Israel want to get into a proper fight for no other reason than to draw the US in, then they're going to end up heavily punished for it, and few will have much sympathy for them, I don't think. Despite politicians insisting the Iran attack was disproportionate and unprovoked, I don't think it was on either score. 
Israel struck their embassy, their sovereign soil. They retaliated, yet did so with restraint, despite the commentary of many politicians, especially British ones here. Then there's the aspect of abject stupidity, too. Thanks to their ongoing transgressions in Gaza, where settlers want to take the land and are cheering at the thought, Israel's actions mean they've actually lost territory, would you believe? This isn't something that's been broadcast particularly widely. In practice, though, if not so much in actuality, they've been exchanging fire, as we know, with Hezbollah and Lebanon pretty much constantly since October 7th. And as a result, they've actually had to evacuate northern areas of Israel that could become Hezbollah targets. Some 80,000 Israelis have been displaced in the north. And this isn't worth covering, it seems. Having taken the fight to Lebanon and Lebanon's allies in Iran and Gaza, Israel may not ever now be able to resettle back along its northern border. It may not ever dare. But, you know, there's a story I think that's worth mentioning. But the main argument, of course, for Israel to continue in Gaza Accord, despite most people regarding it as a genocide and an excuse to grab land, is the claim to rescue those hostages. So far, Israel have managed to kill more of their own captured people than they've rescued. In six months, they've rescued something like three people. And ultimately, when so many more Palestinians are held by Israel, a prisoner exchange could have been done months ago if Netanyahu really wanted to bring those people back. When even the families of those taken are now attacking Netanyahu and calling him a liar on this front now. So why should anyone else still believe him about it? Israel is led by a weak, mad old fool, carrying on as he is to keep himself out of jail, pretty much, and surrounded by even weaker, and in some cases, even madder fools besides. Haaretz haven't been the only paper to cover the problems Netanyahu is in right now, though. The online version of Israel's largest newspaper by circulation, Ynet News, have an article out saying Netanyahu sees himself as a modern-day Winston Churchill, to which I thought, oh God, not another one. We already have one incompetent right-wing idiot with Churchill aspirations, and thank God we got rid of him now. We don't need another bloviating buffoon like Boris Johnson. But, uh, yeah, they reckon Netanyahu's got these ideals as well. It was also possible and correct to hang this sign at the entrance to the meeting room of the War Cabinet, also in the depth of the pit, also in the underground shelter in the heart of the Jerusalem mountains. The Prime Minister of Israel wants to be like Churchill, but the more he tries, the more the likeness eludes him. In this case, he is not alone. The war drums rising from the cabinet room reveal a lack of knowledge of what Churchill demonstrated during the terrible war years. Restraint is not defeat. The gift is not the bride. Patience is not a sign of weakness. Meanwhile, that's not the wind there. A source very familiar with the marathon meetings that took place this week in a series of secret discussion rooms above and below ground say that if they had filmed it and broadcast it on YouTube, today there would be four million people in Israel trying to find a way to escape from here. How very poetic. The very message, though, is that uh, don't let the public know what we're planning and don't let the public know what we think Iran is capable of, because if they found out how terrified we actually were of them, there would be a mass exodus. That's the language coming out of the war room. They are absolutely bricking it. And yet they're still going to carry on. The fact is Iran got through the Iran Dome, or the Iron Dome even, without actually trying that hard. And the fears Iran have clearly imply they can't contain a full-throated military response from Iran. Well, they don't think they can if they escalate matters once more, if they let Netanyahu escalate matters. If they go ahead and attack again this weekend, as is being reported, it doesn't look like they will have time to respond before Iran counters. They've said they'll respond within seconds if Israel repeats its actions against Iran again in order to evacuate people. I would hope an Iranian response again would avoid civilian centers once more, but you just don't know, do you? There's just no, no win for Israel here at all. Escalation will turn more people against them than already have, despite what politicians say, because you know the politicians will once again defend Israel and attack Iran. But their actions have displaced their own citizens in Israel. They are already global pariahs reputationally. They are reliant on foreign aid militarily and financially. Yet the more of a problem they become for global leaders, the more pressure will be on them to stop the supply. Israel really have already lost. It's up to them how badly they choose to go down with it. Fundamentally, Netanyahu had better get the begging bowl out if he's to keep this nonsense up, and that in itself shows how much other nations are enabling Israel to continue to act as they are. But financing another operation in Iran may not be as straightforward for Israel this time as this video recommendation outlines some points over. So give that a watch next, and I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks.